why don't we go ahead and start the show. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Joe Barton. I'm one of the trustees for the Ross Historical Society and Moya Library here in Ross. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today on this beautiful day. You're joining us to hear uh, Julia Flynn Seiler discuss her book, The White Devil's Daughters. Uh, personally, I've been looking forward to this program for, for ever since it was first put on our calendar. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Ross Historical Society and Moya Library, we're a nonprofit, all volunteer organization based in Ross. Uh, we bring you these programs uh, throughout the year and we really appreciate your support uh, for these programs. We have an outstanding uh, turnout today. So let's, uh, let me go ahead and hand it over to Richard Torney, who our historian, and he will introduce our guest speaker today. All right, thank you, Joe. And thank uh, everybody who signed up uh, for your support and your interest in our programs. We do have three programs left in this year's 2021 schedule. On September 10th, we have Jeff Burkhart, who is known as the, the columnist called the Barfly in the Independent Journal, is gonna be talking about the history of some of the cocktails that were uh, invented or have a uh, base here in Marin County and share some amusing stories. And as he suggests, maybe even have a cocktail. Um, on, now, the next program, October, is on Thursday, October 7th. It's off of our usual first Friday schedule, and that was due to a conflict by the speaker. And he's going to be talking about the dairies in Marin County. They were uh, played a very important role in the 1800s when Marin County supplied more dairy products than any other county in the entire state. So Mike Moyle, along with uh, historian Dewey Livingston, have been doing research for some time, and they've identified so far there were 380 dairies in Marin, and they're still finding more. So anyway, Mike is going to be focusing on the uh, dairies that were here in the Ross Valley. Our final program for this year on November 5th is going to feature the namesake of our organization, Jose Moya del Pino. Now, much is known about his life here in the United States, but much less is known about his younger days in Spain. Uh, so he, one of his granddaughters, Paola Coda, is in the process of writing a book about her grandfather and will be doing a presentation for us. Now at the moment we have these all scheduled as Zoom meetings, but uh, we'll just have to see how things uh, work out. So today I'm honored to introduce our guest speaker, Julia Flynn Seiler. Uh, she's a prize-winning journalist and author. Her first book was The House of Mondavi, The Rise and Fall of an American Wine Dynasty, um, published in 2007. Uh, the House of Mondavi was a New York Times bestseller and was chosen one of the top 10 books of the year by Business Week. Her second book was critically acclaimed, Lost Kingdom, The Last Queen, Sugar Kings, and America's First Imperial Adventure, um, which was a San Francisco Chronicle bestseller and received widespread attention on the mainland and in Hawaii. A Julie who attended Ross School and then what was known as the Catherine Branson School is a longtime contributor and former staff writer for the Wall Street Journal. As a London-based correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and Business Week during the 1990s, she wrote stories on various subjects such as Virgin's uh, Richard Branson and the cloning of Dolly the Sheep. She has a Brett, been a guest commentator on BBC, CNBC, and CNN. Julie earned her BA from Brown University in American Studies, a master's from Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism, and an MBA from Northwestern's Kelly, Kellogg Graduates, Graduate School of Management. Long fascinated by the intersection of families and fortune, she holds a special interest in the 19th and early 20th century American history, and her new book, White Devil's Daughters, The Women Who Fought Slavery in San Francisco's Chinatown, published by Alfred Knopf, is set in the underworld of San Francisco's Chinatown at the turn of the century. This book has won two awards from the California Independent Bestsellers Alliance, 
uh, one for nonfiction, the other for California history, and was also a finalist in the Commonwealth Club Nonfiction California Book Awards. Julie lives in Ross with her husband, Charlie, and their two sons, Cody and Andrew, who also both went to Ross School. So I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Julia Flynn Seiler. Richard, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, and it's been really, really fun to swap local history stories with you and local raw stories. Um, and it's a great honor to join the uh, Ross Historical Society. And I'm especially looking forward to the chance to answer some questions today uh, after the presentation. So I'm gonna tell you uh, today a true story about a pathbreaking project that began almost 150 years ago. And there's very deep Marin County ties to this story. And I'm gonna focus a bit on those as well. Um, but, you know, the story is about a pioneering group of people who fought slavery in San Francisco at the turn of the 20th century. And I spent five years working at UC Berkeley's Bancroft Library, Stanford's Special Collections Library, the National Archives and other places, trying to track down descendants who could share their stories with me, track down documents. And I even traveled across the country and across the world uh, trying to dig up information about this story. Um, and my hope is what I discovered has resonance for us in our world today and may also be a little inspiring to you. It was a really inspiring story uh, for me. So I'll start, if I may, by sharing uh, some photographs. I'll try to tell you where I got these photographs um, as well. And let's just uh, begin by recreating the setting for when this project began. So let's move back in time to the 1870s in San Francisco and think about what the city was like then. Now, in the summer of 1873, that's when the very first cable car rumbled up the hills of the city. Uh, the streets are still lit by gas lamps. Um, some of them are cobblestoned, some of them are dirt at that point. There's continual construction and change, a lot like today. And similarly, there is a tremendous amount of anti-Asian agitation and violence. Again, a lot of resonance for our world right now. And a lot of that racism, a lot of that violence was directed at the Chinese residents of the city. So the gold rush, of course, it had ended about two decades earlier. And the Chinese who'd worked the mines and laid the railroad tracks across the West, uh, when those projects were done, they often ended up coming to San Francisco, which was in those days the capital of Chinese America, by far the biggest concentration of Chinese in the North American continent. And San Francisco itself remained a very rough port town in those days with its infamous Barbary Coast Vice District. I came across a newspaper reporter who des described what San Francisco was like then, and he described it as a town of men and taverns and boarding houses and billiard saloons. It was the cussedest place for women. And I chose this photograph to illustrate this. It comes from San Francisco Public Library's absolutely wonderful San Francisco History Center, which is located on the fifth floor of the Civic Center main branch. And I love this photograph because the woman's face in the foreground seems to suggest kind of the, uh, the very rough conditions um, that existed uh, during that time. Now, one of the most cussedest places for women was Chinatown, San Francisco's Chinatown. And it was then a very densely packed ghetto in the heart of the city. It was uh, then, as it is now, centered around Portsmouth Square. Um, and just imagine 12,000 people in roughly eight square blocks. And the vast majority of those people were men 
who had left their families back in China, fully uh, assuming that they would return uh, to their home after they had earned money uh, in what was then known as Gold Mountain or the North American continent. This is a uh, wonderful photograph by uh, the um, German, German photographer Arnold Gente. And uh, I think he titled it something like City of Men or uh, Bachelor of City. I think this comes also from either San Francisco Public Library or the US Library of Congress. I can look it up if anybody's interested. Um, now, there were a, a very large number of brothels uh, established in Chinatown in the response to the demand for sex. And that demand, of course, came from both Chinese men who were uh, in the city without uh, their families, without their wives, um, but also from white men. And the vast majority, in turn, of girls and women who lived in Chinatown in the 1860s and 1870s, um, at least according to official census takers at the time, were designated as prostitutes. Now, a few of them may have chosen that work, um, but the vast majority of uh, scholars believe were tricked or sold or forced into it. Um, and many of them, keep in mind, were very, very young, 12, 13, 14 years old. And the conditions in which uh, they were prostitutes were extraordinarily brutal. The average life expectancy of a young girl or woman who uh, was a prostitute in the mid 19th century was something like four years uh, before they succumbed to disease or to abuse of some sort. Now, the plight of, uh, and of course I should say that uh, there were quite a few of these um, young girls and women who were prostitutes who had been trafficked into that trade. And uh, they, um, this is kind of the iconic photograph of what was then termed a Chinese slave girl. Um, and uh, this comes from the UC Berkeley's Bancroft Library. And, and the plight of, um, the plight of these trafficked girls and women came to the attention first of the wives of Presbyterian missionaries who were working in Chinatown in 1873. And they held a meeting uh, to discuss this social injustice, the, the plight of these girls. And uh, there was an idea that was sparked there. And the idea was, well, uh, let's set up a way to try to help these young young girls and these young women. And uh, this idea was way, way ahead of its time. Um, and it was, you know, just to put it in context a little bit, this was a time when even white women uh, did not have the right to vote, uh, had little economic or political power. Uh, and of course, Chinese women uh, did not have that either. Um, yet, let's go to the next one. Uh, this was, um, this was a, also a time when women were starting to organize into social clubs and other, other ways to exert some, uh, some, some uh, modicum of power. And this house is a very good example of that because although, again, you know, women generally, middle-class women did not have jobs outside the home and did not generally have uh, money of their own. Um, they managed to raise amongst themselves the uh, funds necessary to acquire this very large home and hire the staff to run it. Um, and this home was located on Sacramento Street, uh, right in the shadow of Knob Hill, just about a block and a half uh, down from uh, what is now the University Club and uh, just a bit further from the Fairmont Hotel. Uh, and this house, um, I should say the institution, because they first started in an apartment and then about a year or two later, they were able to buy this house. But it first opened its doors in 1874. And that was 15 years 
before Hull House opened in Chicago. And Hull House, of course, was the pioneering social services agency that was um, made famous by the social worker, Jane Addams. Uh, but in San Francisco, we have our own example of a very uh, remarkable institution that, that started very early. And this institution operated for seven decades as a safe house uh, from the 1870s through the 1930s. Now, the women who ran the home began doing what they called rescue work. And that is a term that we probably would not use today because it seems to strip agency from the women who had been trafficked or were otherwise vulnerable. Um, but that is how they termed it. And uh, this is a photograph almost certainly taken by a news photographer at the time. And it was used to illustrate the word, the work that they were doing. And let, let's talk a little bit about this photograph if we could. Um, on the perch, on the, the metal, um, I don't know what you call it, metal balcony, the metal perch, uh, you have a police officer with a, a girl in his arms with dark hair. And she is the, what in the 19th century would have been termed the slave girl, what today we would call a, a survivor of trafficking. Uh, on the ladder is the uh, police uh, detective or sergeant. Um, almost certainly he was the leader of the Chinatown squad during that time. And I think it's a pretty good bet that, that man that we're seeing there is uh, Sergeant um, Jack Mannion, who, believe it or not, was born in the town of Ross. So a little Ross connection there. He was the longtime head of the Chinatown squad. Now, standing, looking, uh, looking towards the camera is the taller woman. That is uh, the superintendent of the safe house that was opened. And I'll talk more about her later. But really, I want to draw your attention to the woman who is standing next to her. You can't see her face. She's looking up at the girl. And uh, typically, the, the women who uh, ran the house, the white women who ran the house, worked very closely with generally Chinese uh, translators and aides. And those Chinese aides were the first point of contact for the trafficked or vulnerable women when they came into the home. And the very simple reason for that was that very few of the, of the white women could speak Chinese. And so these aides often uh, could speak in the dialect of the, uh, of the girls and the young women who were um, coming into the home. Uh, and so, that, that alley where this photograph is, uh, was taken is still there in Chinatown. And uh, in, in fact, um, you can see almost exactly the same thing with the exception of the latter. Um, but anyways, so we know through log books and case files that between 2000 and 3000 residents of the home stayed there between the 1870s and the 1930s. And as this photograph illustrates, you can see that they ranged in ages from very, very young children uh, to women in their 20s and 30s. Um, there are some staff members shown in this photograph. The superintendent is in the middle, uh, the white woman with the uh, Gibson girl uh, hair. Um, and this photograph comes from the California State Archives. It was taken by um, a photographer named Louis J. Stellman, who is a very uh, interesting, has an interesting story of his own as well. Um, now, there were also babies occasionally that came into the home. And some of those babies were born to residents um, who had been prostitutes or been sex slaves sometimes. Um, others were orphans who were left to the care of the home. And this was, remember, before there were a great deal of social services in the city of San Francisco. So the safe house at Sacramento Street was one of the few places where Chinese, uh, desperate Chinese parents could uh, leave a, an infant or a child and be assured that they would be taken care of. And the women who 
ran the home, who financially and in other ways supported the home, uh, their goal was not only to try to help vulnerable women, but also to share their Christian faith. Uh, and their hope was that the women coming through the home would become Christians. Um, although conversion to Christianity was not a requirement for staying at the home. And the conversion rate actually was pretty modest. Um, I, I went through uh, the annual reports uh, that were prepared by staffers and they would list uh, conversions or baptisms. And uh, they were not, there were not very many of them over the years. So I would describe this small band of uh, women who ran the home for all those decades as faith-based activists. And they were both Asian and white, and they worked together in a cross-cultural uh, way that was in some ways kind of ahead of its time. And they fought the slave trade, the human slave trade for seven decades together. And of course, they were almost always short of money. As anybody who has ever volunteered or worked in a nonprofit knows, they were living from donation to donation. Yet I would also say that it's very remarkable how much they actually achieved. Uh, first of all, they managed to raise awareness of the issue of, of human trafficking. Um, they testified in front of legislators. As a result of that testimony, uh, they helped pass one of the first pieces of anti-trafficking legislation in the state of California. And they hosted an enormous number of VIPs over the years, including a presidential party and the philanthropist Andrew Carnegie and his wife. Um, and I, sh I should have mentioned, but one of their first backers was, uh, was um, Phoebe Hurst, who of course was the wife of the mining executive George Hurst, who later became a, a senator, and the mother of William Randolph Hearst, the media mogul. Uh, so she was involved with this project uh, very early on. Now the person who became the public face of the home was named Donaldina Cameron. And that's a very old fashioned name, isn't it, Donaldina? Uh, her Scottish family called her Dolly. And this is a photograph of her at the age of 25. And I think I've now seen probably every photograph in existence of Donaldina Cameron. Never again after this photograph was taken, probably in 1895, shortly before she arrived at the home to uh, instruct the residents on a sewing, of all things. Um, but, you know, she's pictured so delicate in such be delicate, uh, beautiful clothing here with the white gloves and the netting and the flowers in her, the artificial flowers in her, in her, in her hat. Um, and the photographs uh, really from 1895 onward show her in extremely practical dark clothes, uh, sometimes with her sleeves rolled up, usually with a very determined look on her face. And she gained a reputation for a great physical courage. She would scramble over rooftops to, uh, to help vulnerable girls and women. And she seemed to be fearless. Um, and she became so effective at disrupting the business of human trafficking that her enemies in Chinatown, uh, and those enemies were primarily organized uh, crime gangs that were trafficking girls and women from China to the West Coast. Um, those enemies came to call her the White Devil. And that's where the title of my book comes from, The White Devil's Daughters. Now, the White Devil, of course, is a racial epithet. And it was very um, consciously uh, thrown at her. Uh, and it was meant to scare girls and to prevent them from seeking her out or uh, running away to the home. Um, at the same time, you know, some of the girls and, and women who were residents at the home called her Lomo or mother. And uh, one of the most touching things that I found in my years of research for this book were a fold, was a folder of, uh, of Mother's Day cards to Donaldina Cameron, Dolly Cameron, from former residents of the home. 
And those former residents scattered far and wide. Some went back to China, some went to New York, some would marry and went to the Midwest. But they would send her cards and thank her for what she did for them. And they were really, really touching. Now, Dolly and her team faced many, many threats and challenges over the years. Uh, of course, right at the turn of the 20th century was an outbreak of bubonic plague in Chinatown and there were quarantines set up. And the house at 920 Sacramento Street was just outside the quarantine lines, but uh, it was still a very, very frightening time to be near Chinatown. Um, I think though that one of the most terrifying moments uh, that Dolly and her team faced was the morning of April 18th, 1906. And that's when this photograph was taken. And in fact, this photograph was taken perhaps a um, hundred yards up from the house, which would be looking down towards the financial district and the house is on the left. Um, and, uh, you know, there were 50 residents living in the home at that time. And it was Dolly's first person account of leading those girls and young women through the chaos of the streets, through a very, very frightening disaster that riveted me and made me want to write this book. Um, she had a very distinct voice and I, it was almost as if she could evoke the smell of uh, smoke in the air and the chaos. And I wanted to learn more about her. You know, I'd grown up in the Bay Area. I'd never heard of her before. I'd never seen this house. And it really piqued my curiosity. So that's why I decided I'd go ahead and, and, and try to learn more. And as I, it went along, as my research went along, I became more and more fascinated by the resilience and the grit of not only Dolly, but also um, the other staffers in the home and the residents of the home as well. Um, and it became a challenge for me. Could I recreate their stories? Could I find enough to build a narrative, a compelling narrative about their stories? Now, those earthquake refugees, uh, I remember I said there were about 50 residents of the home living there at, on the morning of April uh, 18th, 1906. Um, by, they spent the first night in the city on Van Ness Avenue in a church. And by the time they made their way back across the city to a ferry, and they managed to get on a ferry, all, all of the group, the group had expanded to about 60 people. And they made their way on a ferry across the bay and they uh, landed Sausalito. And uh, the next night they spent at the seminary in San Anselmo, which you should see on your left. Now the seminary building, as most of you probably know, was uh, damaged. Uh, the buildings were quite damaged uh, in the 1906 earthquake as well. Um, and in fact, the only place that this very large group of people could find to sleep for the first week or so was in a barn in the seminary. And uh, I think there was, uh, you know, kind people who lent them blankets and helped provide them with some very basic food, beans, and whatever was around. Uh, but the bad fortune was that it started raining shortly after. Uh, in those days. And so it was a miserable, miserable experience, those, that first week in the barn for them. And how do I know that? I've, I've seen the, the, uh, the letters that Dolly wrote to her family. I've seen other accounts about what happened as well. Uh, so within, they realized they needed to go somewhere else. And so they managed to locate a, an old Victorian house and you see that on your, it should be on your right, um, which is still standing today. It's uh, on Bayview, uh, Bayview Street, Bayview Avenue in Santa Fe in the Gersel Park area. And this is a photograph of those earthquake refugees on the front porch. And you see how young some of those refugees are. 
Um, and they spent much of the summer of 1906 in this house in San Rafael. And they managed to erect a kind of tents out in the backyard. And they were trying to have classes and, and um, but it was an extremely overcrowded situation. And they realized this is not, you know, once it started to get colder, they were going to have to figure out something else. And they had a lot of trouble finding a place in Marin that would take them. Um, and remember, across across the Bay Area and across the West, and uh, there was still a great deal of kind of anti-Asian sentiment. Um, so they ended up going to Oakland instead, and they eventually did find a place to live there. And one of their, oh, oh I'm going to jump forward here. Um, sorry about that. And one of their great uh, benefactors at that time was another Marin County prominent person at the uh, beginning of the 20th century. And here he is pictured. His name was Robert Dollar. And many of you were probably familiar with him. He was uh, known by the honorific Captain Dollar. And he was the owner of the largest steamship line between China and San Francisco and was a very wealthy man. He, right around 1906, 1907, he had, uh, must have been 19, or maybe it was 1905, he purchased with his wife um, what he would rename Falkirk Mansion. Uh, and they were refurbishing that. And he came to know those, um, those earthquake refugees who were living not too far away. And they were, uh, the dollars invited uh, the group to come uh, visit them at Falkirk, I believe, uh, that summer of 1906. And then more importantly, Robert Dollar uh, and his wife, who his wife eventually joined the board of this organization, um, they agreed to fund a separate home for the younger residents, uh, which was very much needed. And uh, that home became known as the Ming Kuang home in Oakland. And initially it was kind of a, again, a very dilapidated uh, place. Uh, and with Robert Dollar's help, they, uh, the staffers and board of um, the mission home hired the architect Julia Morgan to design, design a home that was more uh, comforting and more comfortable for the younger residents. And that home is now owned by Mills College. Uh, actually, uh, I'm, it was, let's see, I'm, now I'm getting mixed up. I went to visit it recently. It is now, let me see, the Julia Morgan School for Girls in Oakland. And it's, it's right on the Mills College um, campus. Uh, but it may be separate. It's a, it's, I think it's a K through eight school. Um, somebody in the audience, I'm sure will know the answer to this, but the dollars were hugely helpful uh, to this project over the years. They also provided steamship fare uh, and passage for um, uh, staffers and also for uh, women who wanted to return to China or who were being deported to China. So, oh, where did that go? Darn it. Okay, here it is. Uh, I want to tell you about one of those earthquake refugees. Now, her name was Tai Young. And uh, this is her, this is a formal portrait on the left of her, probably taken in her late teens, early 20s. But when she was an earthquake re refugee, she was with that large group, she was young, even much younger than that, this photograph portrays. Um, and Ty is such a, a fascinating uh, story. Um, she was sold by her family as a child servant. Uh, and she ran away to the rescue home at 920 Sacramento Street at the age of 12 to avoid an arranged marriage. And she gained an education at the home and became a translator and an aide. And eventually she became the first Chinese woman to work at Angel Island when it opened in 1910. And her story is so fascinating. She fell in love with a fellow worker at Angel Island. Now, that worker was a white man. Uh, and it was against the law in those days for uh, whites and non-whites to marry each other. So uh, Ty and her, uh, her fiancé went to Washington State, where it was legal for them to marry. And they got married. 
came back to California and they both promptly lost their jobs. Uh, they were resilient people. They managed to uh, find other jobs and uh, do a bunch of interesting things in their lives. Um, the photograph of Ty behind the wheel of this car is particularly interesting. It was provided to me by the, hist the late historian, Judy Young. And um, it was a newspaper photograph. And the caption was that Ty was, quote, a progressive Chinese American woman and noted that it had she had cast a vote in a presidential primary in 1912. She, of course, was born in America. Um, but the funny thing about this, story, this photograph that uh, Judy shared with me was that um, Ty, who was very short statured, she was about four foot eight or so, um, and, she, and it was known by the nickname Tiny, in fact, never learned how to drive. So this was completely staged for the newspapers. Um, but anyway, so we'll jump past Robert Dollar. Now I'm going to tell you about a few of the other women who passed through the home over the years. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit uh, about, you know, what the home is now and uh, may, about some of the descendants of these people. Um, so this is another young woman who really blossomed at the home, and her name was Bessie Jiang. And she too had fled an arranged marriage in China, and she ran away to the home at the age of 13. And it quickly became very clear to the staffers at the home that she was extraordinarily bright. And with their help, she managed to uh, become one of the first Chinese American women to integrate a high school in San Francisco that was predominantly white at that time. Then she became uh, the first Chinese American woman to graduate from Stanford University. And on the left is uh, her yearbook photograph that I found at Stanford from 1927. Um, and Bessie uh, kept on going. So she finished up at Stanford, then she went to medical school. She graduated uh, despite great odds. Um, there was a lot of, again, a lot of prejudice against Chinese Americans then. And she became a doctor and uh, she returned to the San Francisco Bay Area and helped care for some of the younger residents of the home. Uh, at that point, by the time that she got back, which was the late 20s, early 30s, the Ming Kwong home had moved uh, down to the South Bay. So anyways, that's Bessie's story. And this is one of the stories that I, I, I was so touched and so moved by. And as a historian, you know, it's, it, I'm always looking for primary materials for people who have recorded their experiences in some ways. And one of the great challenges of this project is that women who have been trafficked, women who are vulnerable uh, and have been forced into prostitution, often do not leave any record of their experience and certainly not um, much of or not much of a record. Uh, but an exception was this woman, a Japanese American woman or Japanese woman who became known as Yamada Waka. And Yamada Waka uh, ended up there was a terrible time in Japan at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century. So she ended up in Seattle uh, in a desperate situation at working as a prostitute. Um, with the help of a man, she made her way down to San Francisco and eventually found her way to uh, the home at 920 Sacramento Street. Um, and she got an education there. The home... Uh, helped her find a tutor. She again was very, very bright. And in this, her case, it was a Japanese tutor. And she and the Japanese tutor fell in love with each other. And they returned to Japan in 1905, right before the earthquake struck. And when she got back to Japan, uh, she, her career really blossomed. She ended up opening a home similar to 920 Sacramento Street in Japan for uh, as a safe house for women who were vulnerable in a variety of different ways. Uh, she became a leading feminist writer. Uh, 
um, and was became very well known for her, her views. In fact, this photograph is from the US Library of Congress. Uh, it was taken in 1937 when Yamada Waka was on a book tour and she had just gone to visit Eleanor Roosevelt, who was then the first lady of the United States, uh, to tell her story and share some of her experiences. So I just love this photograph. It was taken in front of the White House. I don't know if she had just seen Eleanor or she was just about to see Eleanor, but uh, it's a pretty amazing story to go from someone who kind of hit the absolute bottom of uh, uh, feeling powerless and feeling vulnerable to meeting with the First Lady of the United States. Okay, and this is the last uh, resident of the home I'm going to tell you about. Uh, and she was one of the girls who came to call Dolly Cameron mother. Her name was Tin Fu Wu. And she arrived at the home in 1894, shortly before Dolly Cameron got there in 1895. And now Tian had been sold by her father in China when she was a very young girl. And she had been sold because um, the proceeds from her sale, he hoped would help pay down his gambling debts. She ended up in a brothel in San Francisco's Chinatown at around eight years old. And she had been sold not as a prostitute or as a sex slave, but as a child servant. Um, but uh, her ownership passed um, through a couple different hands and her owners by 1893, 1894 had badly abused her. They had burned her on their arms and done other terrible things to her. And so a policeman was notified and ended up carrying her, this little child, over to the house on Sacramento Street. Uh, and she basically spent a great deal of her childhood th at that house. And uh, kind of like Yamada Waka, she also ended up leaving a very uh, deep and interesting record of her experience growing up in the house and what happened next. Um, through the staffers of the home, she was able to get a very good education. She went to a boarding school in Philadelphia, and then she went to uh, college. And after college, she decided that she was going to try to find her mother and her grandmother in China, try to find her family. She went back there and kind of in a heartbreaking turn of events, uh, discovered she could not find them. There was enormous amount of chaos um, and, and turmoil, civil strife, strife um, and desperate conditions in China during those years. She, she came back to San Francisco and she realized that the only family she really had was the family at 920 Sacramento Street and specifically Dolly Cameron. And so she said, I would like to come back to work um, at the home. And that's exactly what she did. And not only did she do that, but she, oh, in fact, um, this photograph is so marvelous. I don't know who took it, but uh, it was probably taken when Teen was heading off to boarding school. And she's in a traveling suit that is uh, clearly a little bit too big for her. The, um, the, the uh, uh, sleeves are uh, way too long, uh, but it's such a touching photograph, I think. Um, so in any case, she returns to the home after uh, not only her college education, but her attempt to go back to China to find her family, or her unsuccessful attempt. And she ends up becoming Dolly's, um, you know, key aide. She runs the home in Dolly's absence. She translates in court. She travels the country as a single Chinese, uh, Chinese woman um, to, tr to check up on the former residents of the home who had married and make sure they were, they were in a good situation. Um, so she, uh, you know, she spent decades at the home and uh, arguably was just as important to all of the work that was done there as Dolly Cameron herself. Now, as I mentioned, I traveled all over the country uh, and even overseas for my research. And one of the most moving places I visited was the Cameron family plot in Evergreen Cemetery in Los Angeles. Um, and these photographs I took 
with my iPhone uh, at the family, Cameron family plot. And as you can see, you know, Donaldina Cameron and Tian Fu Wu are buried in the same plot. And in life, they became each other's closest friends and they spent their last years together in Palo Alto. Uh, Dolly Cameron had a, a neat little house and uh, next door she had made sure that Tian had her own little house. Um, so they lived next door to each other. And my book in a sense is about their very unusual friendship. Uh, they were both immigrants. Uh, they were fighting to protect vulnerable girls and women and uh, help those girls and women gain educations. And it's so touching to me that they're buried in the same place. And I also wanted to note that it's a reminder of really how close this history is to us. Um, Dolly, as you can see, died in 1968. She was almost 100 years old, 1968. Uh, and Tian Fu Wu died in 1975, really not that long ago. Um, and I was able to interview people who remember Miss Wu Cameron and Auntie Wu, which is how they were affectionately known. Um, not, not only that, but of course I was able to track down uh, Dolly Cameron's family members. Now, neither Dolly nor Tin ever had children. Uh, neither of them ever married. Um, they really became each other's closest family. Uh, but Dolly Cameron had a number of nieces and nephews. In fact, uh, Ann Cameron lives in Marin County, and she was one of the first people that I contacted. That's uh, Ann Cameron is Dolly's uh, Dolly's niece. Um, so, anyways. Let me tell you a little bit, bring you up to date, a little bit about where we are now. This is a photograph of the home of the safe house that I took uh, not too long ago. And it looks exactly like what you're seeing here. Um, it's made of clinker bricks. This is the rebuilt home after the 1906 air earthquake. And so clinker bricks, as many of you probably know, were salvaged uh, from uh, the firestorms that followed the 1906 earthquake. And uh, it is now um, uh, named Cameron House in Dolly Cameron's honor. And it's a very, very important community center for Chinatown today. Um, it offers after school programs for kids. It has a outdoor playground where kids can, kids can play. During the summers, it runs very large, uh, uh, programs for kids who are not in school. Um, it offers new immigrants uh, English language skills and social services help. And twice a week, I believe it runs a food pantry, which is very, very important. Chinatown remains the densest neighborhood in San Francisco and also the poorest neighborhood in San Francisco. And a lot of uh, the newest uh, immigrants um, end up in Chinatown. And then, as you know, the Chinese American diaspora, particularly in our area, has has gone far and wide. Um, but many many of those immigrants whose parents or grandparents first settled in Chinatown uh, will come back to Cameron House because they remember the the uh, the youth programs or they remember other other things about it. Um, and I wanted to mention too that, uh, this is not a very good photograph, but um, one of the great honors that I had was that the Cameron family, um, first of all, shared their private collection of photographs, of letters, of books, all kinds of stuff uh, with me. So I kept that for maybe a couple of years while I was doing the, doing the book. Um, and then uh, they uh, decided that they would donate it to the Bancroft Library, which um, I helped facilitate. And this is a picture of me bringing this collection into the Bancroft. It's not processed yet, but um, my hope is that scholars in the future will be able to build on some of the, the work that I did and um, will take, take the story in new directions. So, Anyways, I'm, I'm grateful for you listening and um, very much appreciate uh, your time. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm anticipating the question, which is, has human trafficking of uh, Chinese women from China to uh, the West Coast uh, ended? Uh, no, and that's a lot to talk about, uh, that trafficking still happens and the Bay Area remains a major hub of human trafficking. Um, but anyways, on a, on a more, uh, a lighter note, I think uh, the Bay Area has a lot to be proud of and that this really was a pioneering um, effort to raise awareness of human trafficking and fight against it. So again, thank you very much and very happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, thank you so much, Julia, for that uh, presentation. I, um, we are taking questions. You can uh, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type out a question or perhaps uh, use the chat feature to, to give us a question. You can also, and I encourage this, uh, raise your hand. Click the raise hand button and you can uh, you can speak uh, directly to us. Uh, the camera I don't think the camera works, but you can you can talk to us and and ask Julia a question directly. So you're you're welcome to do that. And I know that uh, I might mention Julia. I don't I don't know if you were aware, but our uh, in house his uh, our in house librarian Fran Capaletti organized a who's with us here today, he, he organized a book club to, to read your book and, and discuss it. And I understand there were, there were several people who, who were in that, in that book club. Um, I know that my, my mother read the book. Uh, she couldn't be with us today, but she looks forward to seeing the video on playback, which will be available on our website in a day or two. And then she, and she gave me the book too to read. And I am, I'm uh, reading it every night, and it's a it's a it's a wonderful, well, very well researched and documented uh, book. All the stories are so moving, and uh, it's it. I I my own personally, I just found that it was uh, it was shocking, uh, but also very uplifting. Uh, just the the work that was done on behalf of of these young women who were in this, <laughs> in San Francisco in, in the early days and, and how, how they were rescued and all the people that were, were a part of that. So, so thank you very much. And- um, Yeah, I'll I, add to that, Joe. It, it is interesting how many people did decide to pick that book up and start reading it. And some history books can be a bit dry and hard to read, but this is a good read. I really encourage you to look into it. I could start going over some questions if we still have the time. Uh, one quick question, maybe you don't know, Julia, but what's the population of Chinatown now in San Francisco? Oh, I think my, my best guess is even denser. I think it's closer to like 16,000 now. But I, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to go. I could check that and get back to you. Right. I think any number of us could try to find that out. Uh, did you meet Chinese American? The Chinese American woman who gave one woman presentations about Tai Lung Shultzi in the early 2000s. Sorry about my pronunciation. Uh, they're mentioning they saw it at Sunset Library in San Francisco. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, I met Tai's uh, grandson, and both the grandson and I were interviewed for a PBS short documentary that aired last year on Tai's life. Um, and it's been one of the great pleasures is to meet family members, but I did not meet, I don't know if there was a, a historian. This is a family member who I got to know. We have a, a Gilbert would like to ask you a question. So let me, uh, Gilbert, let me, let me bring you in and, uh, oh, I see. Oh, the actually, video too. actually, okay. Um, my name is Joe Carpenny. I'm the activity director here at Aldersley Garden Retirement Community. Uh, Gilbert, our executive director, is out. This is just his account. Uh, my name well, is Joe, and I have three residents in here, and they want to know where they could purchase the book. <laughs> well, that, that's lovely. Thank you very much. So I always suggest that, uh, if possible, 
people uh, reach out to independent bookstores and the closest to you is Cooper uh, Copperfields on 4th Street in Centerfell, but I am a big fan of uh, Book Passage in Corte Madeira as well. And of course, your Centerfell library's got copies. So thank you oh, for asking. Per perfect, perfect, there you go. And that's easy for me to pick up. I saw Moe's Books in Berkeley had several copies available. So wherever you are in the Bay Area, I think you'll find that. Um, I have another question, I, I don't see. Uh, oh. One of our participants today wrote a book on the earthquake exodus in 1906 over in Berkeley, but he's asking, he found Berkeley's relief camps were segregated and yes. that Asians had separate camps. Do you, can you, does that come up in your research at all? Or? Absolutely. It's also true in San Francisco. They were segregated. And uh, I think that uh, the, you know, I, it's hard to tell whether the staffers and, and Dolly Cameron understood how bad the conditions were in Golden Gate Park. I mean, they wouldn't have known that first day or, or second day. Um, but it, as it turned out, it was probably a very smart idea to get out of the city and come to Marin instead with that large group. Um, there was so much chaos and, and particularly, uh, you know, with so many young children, uh, I think that was a very smart decision on their part. So, but yes, the answer is yes, there was segregation uh, in the East Bay and in uh, San Francisco as well, in those camps. Uh, Julia, we have uh, somebody else who'd like to ask you a question. This is An Antonia, the executive director for the Marine Art and Garden Center. Great. So um, I, I believe that's Antonia. Well, uh, we I'm have more Antonia. than one Antonia. I think there's a, there, she, she'll yeah. tell you. This is my friend Antonia Allegra, the one oh, oh, I'm sorry. writer. I'm sorry, I miss, Antonia, I miss. it's delightful. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so I've made the, I've made the mistake too. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, Julia, the book is just riveting. Each Thank chapter you. is its own story, and then you crochet all of the stories together. And I love the chronology in the back of the book. It really makes it clear. So thank you. Thank you for writing it. And it truly brought many memories to me. For instance, I was born and raised in San Francisco as were my parents and most of my grandparents. And I can remember as a girl, uh, after school, mom would pick us up on Broadway between Webster and Fillmore and often drive us through Grant Avenue, Sacramento. She would point out the Donaldina Cameron home. I would see men with long braids in the back of their heads. I mean, this is wow, 1957. Yeah, and I would have been about um, 12 years old at that time. And also, I remember on the date of my birthday, I was taken on a very special trip with mom and dad in the car. And we drove down the Barbary Coast, the street on, I think it's Pacific. <laughs> And I saw all of the, the people, you know, flaunting the various girls and places and all of the rest. And so that, again, it would be 1957 when I was 12 years old. Um, so what you've done is you have given life to what I saw a little bit later than this book. But Donaldine, the camera's name was constant for all five of us sisters. We knew about her. Oh, that's so marvelous. Thank you, Antonia. And I remember telling you about this project. You were the, one of the first people, per, uh, one of the first persons I've, I shared uh, this project with. So Right. At Meadowood, when you were a speaker at the Wine Writers Symposium. Yep. Yes. Well, it's lovely to hear from you. Thank you for your kind words. Oh, the book is terrific, and I've sent, sent many and encouraged many to buy them. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia. Sure. Uh, one, a couple other just questions, and Antonia mentioned this too, seeing the long hair, the ponytails of the men. Is there, for those who don't know, is there any quick explanation or about sure, what that is? There, sure, there is a quick or, explanation. So they were known as cues. And the men would keep those long, uh, long ponytails because they were intending to come back to China or to return to China. And it was um, 
expected that they would have them. And in fact, in some of the many anti-Chinese measures uh, enacted by the city of San Francisco in the 19th century, one of them was cutting off the queues um, if you were arrested, um, uh, which was a uh, great punishment. So. Let's see, uh, Fran, do you see any more questions? Uh, one asked if Cameron House was a model for Hull House in Chicago. Oh, that's such yeah. a great question. Well, it, yeah. it, it was 15 years before Hull House. Um, you know, I, I never really found a strong connection between Jane Addams and Donaldina Cameron. I'm not sure if they knew each other or not. Um, you know, they were both roughly settlement. I mean, they, in the in the rough re area of settlement houses, they could both be described that way. I would call Cameron House more of a safe house, um, but it offered the same kind of services to immigrants. Um, so I'm on a campaign actually uh, to try to raise the profile of Cameron House and really re focus our attention on it as an important place in anti-trafficking history. Uh, but that's an ongoing problem. And, you know, I think that many people think trafficking and awareness of trafficking began a, just a few years ago. It's been going on a very, very long time. Now, I don't know if Joe and Richard will cut me off, but I'll keep going until you're finished. Uh, I, here's a question. Is there a possibility the book will be made into a movie and I might follow up? Who would play that? <laughs> well, I'm 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 thrilled to say that we have been uh, approached by uh, several different groups or individuals about making it into a movie. Um, my experience so far <laughs> on the realm of movie stuff, the House of Mandavi has been options since the moment basically it was published. So 15 years, and. Uh, I keep cashing the the uh, the checks, the um, option checks, and you know it, these projects get so far, and I've stopped thinking about it or worrying about it. Um, and if it happens, it happens. I, you know, I'm not a screenwriter; I'm just working on the next book project. So I don't know. Yeah, people are curious what's next, and I'm sure they're they're going to find out when the time is right. Well, another, I, I would say a, a remarkable story with very deep roots um, uh, in Marin. So uh, a, good, a good history story. Okay, I, I know we're, we're a little bit, we've run over our time a little bit, uh, but everybody who's, uh, who's joined us is still, is still with us. So, uh, but I think it's, it's uh, probably time to wrap up. Thank, thank you so much, Julia. This has been a real pleasure, very interesting. Um, and thank you, thank you for everybody who's joined us. Thank you for the outstanding turnout. Everybody at the Ross Historical Society really appreciates the support. We'll continue to bring these Zoom presentations, these webinars to you as long as necessary, but we do hope in the fall to return to some some live, <laughs> some in-person presentations. Would, wouldn't that be novel? <laughs> it seems like so long ago. So, well, And if you want to watch it again, this will be available. And if there are questions, let us know. We'll try to get them. Yep, a a absolutely. Uh, in a day or two, it'll be on our website. Tell your friends uh, or, or watch it again and be sure to pick up the book. It's a, it's, it's a fascinating read as well as a, as well as Julia's other books that are all very well researched and, and uh, wonderful reads. So, um, so with that, uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Julia. And thank you everybody, really enjoyed right. it. Everybody have a wonderful day, thank you. Thank you.